Well, as we walk through this Advent season, uh, it was on my heart to uh, begin a sermon series, to do a sermon series through what's called the Apostles' Creed. This may seem kind of a, a bit of an odd kind of decision for uh, uh, Christmas season. But as we talked about last week, what we hope in, the hope, the warmth of the Christmas season and what we look to in this time for that light, it's not empty, but it comes from deep, deep substance, from what we call truth. And there's, it's significant for us in this day and time when the, where there is a, a, a blatant and overt erosion and attack against what is true, and that there is no absolute truth, that all the more we need our hope grounded in reality, grounded in substance, and not that we are pulled by culture or by our emotions and our feelings. What we believe, as we talked about last week, what we believe matters. The Apostles' Creed is one of these uh, ancient declarations of faith. It's what we call a statement of faith. And, and, and it's been recited by Christians, followers of Jesus, for th over a thousand years. And it's united us across the world and throughout time in essential and fundamental truths of life, of who God is. These truths we need. They're not just good ideas. We need these truths. And, and again, as we saw last week, we're all believers. It's a matter of what do we believe. And when we believe the truth, Jesus said, when we believe what is true, we will experience freedom. And that's why we're walking through the Apostles' Creed as a very concise method that, that believers be developed early on in the first hundred years after Jesus' death and resurrection, they developed this creed as a simple way to remember the most important truths. Now, in this creed, as we're going to read it here shortly, you're going to see some words that have been used for a long period of time. You're going to hear, see the word Catholic. The Catholic, you, that word Catholic doesn't mean the Roman Catholic Church. So we're not all espousing allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church, just in case you were concerned, Okay. It's a small c, and that small c Catholic word means universal. God's people throughout time and through all around the world. The universal church. You hear words too, like God descended, excuse me, uh, uh, Jesus descended into, into Hades or some versions hell or things like that. Don't worry, we're going to unpack what that means down the road here. Stay tuned. In the meantime, would you join with me together here in reciting the Apostles' Creed, these foundational truths of, God, of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to Hades, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning, as we unpack a portion of the Apostles' Creed, we're focusing today on, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We're going to unpack and see how he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness. Oh, wait, that's, that's Santa. That's, that's not Jesus. That's not God the Father well, hold on here. Unfortunately, the reality is we often treat God, the Father, like he is Santa. 
right? Too often we, we might respond or react or think about God as if he's somebody that if, we're, if we do our good things, because he's got his naughty list, he's got his nice list, and he's checking it twice, right? That if we give God our good behavior, he's going to give us what we want on our Christmas list, on our prayer list. We oversimplify God into this kind of transactional kind of relationship, like we're going to Walmart, we pay him our good works, and he gives us what we want. Too often it's true, right? But it's not just Santa Claus that we kind of have this distorted view. We have other distortions of God in, in our life. In the world of psychology, we call these things projections, like this screen here. The screen doesn't hold the image of Santa and these words on it. It's a projection from the machine onto that. And God, like this screen, is somebody we project onto him our pain, our past, our other relationships, our own sinful brokenness. We try to create God in our image, how we want him to be. And Satan knows there's an enemy of evil out there that knows that what we believe about God either will bring freedom or it will enslave us. It will destroy us. From the very beginning, he set out to distort the image of God in the mind of Adam and Eve. He set out to distance us from God. Because if he can distance us or distort our image of God, he can destroy us. What we believe matters. What is true matters. Freud would say, God is a creation of ourselves, of our own psychological weaknesses. God does not exist, only that we need him to exist in order to survive. And so we create him out of our pain and our problems, our projections. Freud is wrong. Just be clear but he's not altogether wrong because we do project on the God. Do you want to believe a distortion or do you want to believe what's true? If we're going to believe what is true, we need to receive the truth from God who revealed it to us. He didn't just set it out there, himself out there, that we've got to figure it out. and find. No, he's a God who is near, as we will find today, and he's revealed himself. And today in his word, we're going to be preaching through John, excuse me, Acts 17. Acts 17, verses 22 through 31. So if you have a Bible or Bible app, you can go ahead and turn there. We have evidence, and based on evidence, not just feelings and emotions and our own psychological brokenness, we have evidence to believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, He's actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. 
The times of ignorance of God, the times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Would you pray with me here as we receive God's word? Holy Spirit, we ask for your grace and your mercy, Lord, to open our hearts this morning. As you shine your light, as you shine your light, expose the darkness, expose the distortions in our life of of who you are. And reveal to us the truth that we might believe on the truth. And as you told us, Jesus, when you believe what is true, there is freedom. There is life. So Spirit, do that work in us today. Meet us, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, for your filling in me, your broken vessel, to proclaim your truth proclaim what what we need to hear and change me change me holy spirit in your name we pray amen as we come to this particular passage it's always important when we're stepping into a portion of scripture uh, that we look at the context and we understand what's going on here and and we're in the book of Acts, which is accounting the, the story of the church and the beginning of the church, the forming of the church, and the advancing of the good news of Jesus to all the world. Paul, who God drew to himself, Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, Paul, who was a murderer of followers of Jesus, God drew to himself and showed him his grace and his kindness And he himself was saved and has become one of the greatest champions and missionaries of sharing the good news, the truth of Jesus. He is in Greece here, in Athens. And one of their methods here was was to show up to their places of worship and to share with them using their own uh, 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 forms of worship and their methods of worship and the things they worship to share with them about the truth of who God is. Paul in Athens, as you know, they they had many, many gods. And it was very common among so many people groups that there's so many gods, and gods for for, for fertility, and gods for uh, uh, the sun, and gods for the rain, and gods for prosperity, gods for power, uh, uh, gods for for, for judgment, the god of, of, of death, Hades. It had all these different kinds of gods representing all these things of creation that are created things. And Paul took advantage of this opportunity in, in Athens, seeing that they had the inscription of the unknown God as an opportunity to tell them about the one, the one true God. And in this, we see many similar features to the Apostles' Creed itself for us. And what Paul shares with the non-believers, the pagans in Athens. He begins here explaining there is a God who exists. He's not an unknown God. He's a known God. In verse 24, he talks about the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth. In these verses here, Paul begins to expound, there is a God who exists. He's not unknowable, he is a knowable God. There is a singular divine being, not not gods or God in the abstract, but a God in particular. A God who's revealed himself to all of us. We all have to answer the question, And we've been wrestling with these questions throughout time. These questions of, why are we here? How did we even get here? And of course, these two questions are very much intertwined in terms of how we answer them. Is there something greater or bigger 
than us that pre-existed humanity? Did we, this nature, the universe, did all of this come into existence spontaneously? Now, this is a modern belief in terms of the spontaneous generation or creation, if you will, coming from an evolutionary thought. We, it's important for us to consider what started everything. Is there evidence of God? Or are we just, again, like many secularists and atheists have said, are we just merely creating God ourselves for our weakness? Is there evidence? We, the simple question of how did the all things get started? R.C. Sproul has a great quote here. He says, For the world to be self-created presupposes that the world exists so that it can create itself. For something to create itself, it has to be there before it's there. Okay, you still with me? In order for things to just spontaneously exist, something had to pre-exist the spontaneous existence for something to exist. That may not have helped. <laughs> we know that you can't get something from nothing. If something came, it's because something, something, some potential energy, something was there to begin it all. If anything exists now, then something has always existed Something or someone eternal. We did not just happen. The question isn't did something exist, but what pre existed us? Of course, we as believers, we place our faith in the existence of a being. That there was an intelligent designer that brought all things together, and we, we have more evidence for that. But an atheist, let's just be clear, for those who don't believe and don't believe in the God that's revealed to us as Christians, it takes just as much faith or as a much intellectual suicide, as they might like to say. It takes just as much faith to believe in something that is not God, that preexisted and spontaneously generated our existence. But we have further evidence. Consider the, 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 the very meticulous and fine tuning of the universe and let alone our world earth such that, are you breathing right now? Any of you in the house breathing? Yes, you're all breathing because you're here and you're alive. The fact that you breathe oxygen and your body needs it, and this earth within which we live supplies it, and our bodies don't just merely just kind of just expand and evaporate because we have gravity that holds us together and keeps us in body. There are so many factors and rules. We are just perfectly the right distance from the sun so that we don't freeze up and become ice cubes or we don't burn but we have just enough heat and warmth in order for things to grow and for there to be seasons and the food to be supplied. The fine tuning of our very universe that allows for there to be life. And not just any kind of life, but the very fact that you and I can have a philosophical, theological conversation means we can reason. All these things, this, this very fine-tuning is further evidence. This, was, this didn't just happen. The probability of this is so significant. It's impossible unless there's an intelligent designer. Does God exist? We believe in God. Not just any kind of God that we would create, but there is a revealed God, a true God, a personal God, a particular God. In addition to logic, our hearts kind of know this. You know, you think of your bodies. You think like the, the, when, 
when you're hungry, there's not always food there, but our hunger in our stomachs and our bodies, when it gets growling a little bit there, it's an indication that our body needs something. That even though food may not be there, physically present, it's evidence that we were made to eat and we need to consume something because our body is telling us we need food. Not just in the same way when we feel lonely. It's an indication, even though somebody may not be there, the very fact that we feel lonely is the evidence. That there's something inside us that says we were made for community. I was made for relationship. There's something inside of us, each of us, that says there's more to this life. I, I, I know I have value, I have dignity, I have worth. Where does, where does this sense of, of my need to, for respect, where's the sense of injustice that, there's, that there is right and wrong? Where, where does this come from in my soul? There can't be just this life. There's got to be more than this life and more to this life. This in our soul, these deeper questions are indicative of there is something, someone made to satisfy and answer those questions. Not for us to merely be proven to be strong enough to survive and face this void of darkness and those who can survive the evolutionary abyss. God exists, but we have even more, friends. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, there is a humble yet significant event in which a baby was born, and it wasn't just any baby. But around this baby, so many miracles and so many I I I significant things happened, pointing to there's something more happening. This baby would grow to become a man who would raise the dead, who would heal, who, who would release people from torturous experiences called demonic oppression. This man himself would die and come back to life. This man claimed to be God's son, it's Jesus. We have the revelation. We have the evidence of Jesus Christ entering human history to declare there is a God, and not just a God, but a particular God who's come even to us, who loves us. And then Jesus would say to Philip, who says, show us the Father. And he says to him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We believe in a God, but a revealed God to us. A God in particular. A God who is knowable. In order to deconstruct our distortions that we have in our souls and our hearts in order to experience his truth, to experience himself because he is the truth. So he is not just a God, but God, the Father Almighty. God Almighty. In the verses here, as Paul explains to the, to the, to the Greek people, he speaks of how God is the, the maker of the world and everything in it. God is the sustainer. He doesn't need to be served He's self-sufficient. He needs nothing. But he's the one who holds life, holds our very existence together. He's the creator of all things and that we might all pursue him, God the Father Almighty. What does it mean that we proclaim that God is almighty? We see in these verses here that God is transcendent, all right? God is trans. I'm going, to, I'm going to drop some big words here this morning, all right? We're going to expand our vocabulary because our God is not a shallow God. He's deep, amen? God is transcendent. It means he's high, above, uh, uh, apart from all that's created. It, it, it means he's powerful. He's worthy of worship. He exists as a higher being. 
This is so important for us today. Today in our expression of faith, we want God, we love the nearness of God. And we shrivel, we shrink back to a God who is high and above us because that leads us to, he's an angry God and he's a judgmental God and he's a vengeful God. No, 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 no. That's our projection onto him. A God of power. He is a God of power, but he's not an abuser. The almighty God being over everything and, and sustaining everything is necessary if he's actually to, to be God. His power over all things means that he can accomplish what he wills. All that he wills, all that he intends, he can accomplish. This is important, this next part. All that he intends is good. Being almighty, he can accomplish all that he wills, but all that he wills is good. This is so huge. We come, you know, the last several weeks, there's some, been some significant deaths. And it's not like these kinds of deaths are new. And we see, when we look around the world, oh my goodness, the, the evil that's present. And, it just, we can, and it raises important questions. How, if he's almighty, why, why, why is there such injustice in the world? Why is there evil in the world? And then that leads us to questions that can't even actually exist. No, evil actually is further evidence of the existence of God because you can't know what's evil without there being good. This is so important for us as we understand that God is almighty in our personal lives. We're tempted to think and reduce God into overly simplistic ways and that if he's almighty, then he controls everything and we're just merely puppets pulled on strings and everything is controlled and done by him. That's not what it means. What we know to be true and what he reveals in his word, Joseph in the Old Testament expresses to his brothers, what you intended for evil God intended for good. Implied in that statement is there's multiple wills. We are free as human beings. God being almighty, he created us with freedom to choose. That's important because God did not create us to make us love him. Again, like something abusive and narcissistic. God created us with freedom to choose. To choose to love. To respond to his love. We are broken, and we choose ourselves over others, over him. We all have our independent wills, and with our choices, like in Joseph's case, all of their choices for evil, to kill their brother, to send him off and destroy his life, yet God was at work. Not only do we all have the freedom to choose things independent from God and choose sinful things and evil things, our own way, but there is another force at work in this world. We call Satan. There's a demonic, dark, evil force that is at work in this world. God Almighty means that with all the forces at work, including billions of people around the world making choices simultaneously, and this presence of evil that is seeking to destroy God's beautiful creation, with all of this going on, he will always accomplish his purpose, regardless of our sin and the evil at work in this world. He will win. God is working in your suffering, in the evil around you, and at work, in the pain, in the loss, in the darkness, the things that have been taken from you, what has been intended for evil. God Almighty is working and able to transform the pain and the traumas and the evil for good. It's a, that's why it's important that we know God is Almighty. But there's another side of this that some of us believe God is almost mighty. God is almost mighty in, in, in that we don't trust that God 
will accomplish his purpose. We believe God needs a little extra help from us. If any of you are like me, you try to step into God's space all the time, and you're probably riddled with kind of anxiety because you got some control problems. I don't know if we got any people with control problems in the house. I'm going to be the first to admit, uh, uh, my name is Scott Barber, and I'm a control freak. Um, Thank you. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. (laughs) It's so important in believing in God Almighty because it allows us to rest. And take responsibility. We will not take responsibility for what we can control. Our response to God, being responsive beings in this life. If we're trying to control things that only God can control, we're trying to control other people. We're trying to control what they think about us or to get them to do what we want. We're trying to control our circumstances. And no, you need to work my way. Again, nobody here struggles with that except me. Thank God. God isn't almost mighty. Amen? We believe in God the Father Almighty, which allows us to be obedient, to trust him. We don't have to know it all. We don't have to be it all. He is enough. He is trustworthy. Because he's God the Father Almighty, we can come in prayer and believe. He works, and he's listening. God the Father Almighty makes prayer all the more important for you and I. In relating to him and receiving his goodness and his control in the world here, and his control through us, not over us, but through us. J.I. Packer says this, Let me just skip ahead here. The truth of God's almightiness and creation, providence and grace is the basis of all our trust, peace, and joy in God and the safeguard of all our hopes of answered prayer, present protection, and final salvation. As I go through this sermon series, there's several books that I'll leave out available up here for you to check out. These books are really, really good in walking through the Apostles' Creed and the depths of the meaning there. And and I just wanted to highlight them to encourage you to consider taking a look for your own continued growth and development and taking things deeper. God is not just almighty. God is maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean here? Again, we see this in the passage, verse 24 again, God who made the world and everything in it. He made us in verse 26, made from one man, every nation of mankind. He is the origins of all things. We do not just believe in a spontaneous generation or spontaneous creation, but when we pull the curtain back behind this world and universe that exists, we see an intelligent designer as we've discussed. The very fact, as I referred to, we have reason, but we have more than just our capacity to reason and make decisions and determine what's right and wrong, which is not something that's true in animals. It's instinctive. This indicates something that the Bible tells us, and the, the truth of this is that we were made in his image. We are set apart from all other things that are created because we as human beings were made in the image of God, meaning that we have certain characteristics like that of God. The capacity for love. The capacity for compassion, for relationship. Not just for survival, but for the good of another, to sacrifice ourselves for the good of another. That doesn't make any sense in an evolutionary context. We have the capacity of joy, beauty. What good is being able to have art or the arts of any kind and appreciating music or the visual arts? What good is that in an evolutionary kind of context? That's absolutely 
meaningless and worthless. It doesn't bring us anything. But it is good. The music we play and, and as we hear and as we sing it, the images we love. I don't know about you guys, but I want a white Christmas, all right? I'm, I want a white Christmas. Any white Christmas people in the house here? Any Scrooges in the house? I know you're here, Scrooges. Yes, you are. That beauty of that freshly fallen snow, right? It's absolutely spectacular. It stirs in our hearts something of significance. Our capacity to have beauty we can see color. Did you know that, I mean, we're especially, again, the fine-tuning, we can see color and it produces something in us that's joyful and pleasurable. That's just crazy because we're made in God's image. God is creator, maker of all things, meaning he has authority. If he's the maker, then we are to respond and we're to look to him for our purpose, our design, our direction. We're to turn to him. But instead, our tendency is to run from him, right? Or, or our tendency is we want to recreate God in our image. Our tendency is to want to be God, to replace him. And so we, we, if we believe in God... We believe in the God that we can fashion that can work for us and accomplish our purposes and accomplish our ends and works for us. He's our servant, our sugar daddy. The authors of this book, Rooted here, have this humorous explanation of what would creation kind of sound like or look like if God was more like us. In the beginning, it was 9 o'clock. So God got, got off to work. He filled out a requisition to separate light from death. He considered making the stars to beautify the night and the planets to fill the skies, but thought it sounded like too much work. So he decided to knock off early and call it a day. And he looked at what he had done and he said, it'll, ha it'll have to do. On the second day, God separated the waters from dry land and he made all the dry land flat, plain, and functional so that, behold, the whole earth looked like Idaho. <laughs> he thought about making mountains and valleys and glaciers and jungles and forests, but he decided it wouldn't be worth the effort. And God looked at what he had done that day and said, it'll have to do. And God made a pigeon to fly in the air and a carp to swim in the waters and a cat to creep upon dry ground. And God thought about making millions of other species in all sizes and shapes and colors, but he couldn't drum up enough enthusiasm for any other animals. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about the cat. <laughs> so God looked at all he had done, and God said, it'll have to do. So he breathed a sigh of relief and said, thank me, it's Friday. <laughs> we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. If he is our creator, then friends, our response is to be worshiping him. He created, but the things that he created, we tend to worship them. We're not like the Grecians who necessarily have all these different images, a, a, a God of fertility, a God of death, a God of, of rain and water and, and all gods for every kind of thing, sun, moon, and stars, all the, no, no. We don't do that nowadays. We just have different gods of a physical form. Money, our jobs, sex, relationships, people, good things that God created, but we make them the things that we live for. We make them the things that give us value and identity and worth. And we continue to keep coming back and we're broken and we're empty and, and we don't have that worth and, 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 and self-esteem and, and, and that direction and that purpose because we keep going back to these broken things, the created things that were never meant to satisfy, the created things that bring us joy are to point to the one who is joy, who is love. 
Because only he can satisfy. Our response to our creator should be worship and devotion to him to receive the good things he gives as gifts, to be thankful for the things, but not devote our lives to them. Thankful for our work, thankful for his provision, thankful for, for his achievements and, uh, and our accomplishments, thankful for love and intimacy and food and pleasure. Thankful, but these are not the things we live for. He is worthy of our worship, friends. What is the distortions that may exist in you and I towards our creator or towards his creation? Finally, he is God the Father. He is God the Father. Like I mentioned, he's not merely this all-powerful being over all the universe and the earth and this distant God who reigns in power. He's revealed as he's slow to anger. He's abounding in love and kindness. He is a patient God. Paul explains he's a near God, our Father. Even though the Grecians had the phrase in verse 30, 28, in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. Times of ignorance got overlooked now. But yet actually, excuse me, verse 27 God is not far from each one of us. This is called the imminence of God. He is both transcendent and high over all things, but he is imminent. He is near. He is among us. That word imminent comes from the word we, we, we love to express, and we sing about this at Christmas time. He is Emmanuel. L is the word for God. He is God with us, God near us, Emmanuel. The evidence that God is not far off, that he is not a God that's just judging us from a distance. He's not using his power to just get what he wants. His demonstration that he is good. Being a father, he is good to you and I. He steps towards us. He doesn't take things from us that maybe earthly fathers have done to you or people in power have done, but he used his power to sacrifice himself for you. He sent his son in our place. God the Father, God in all his glory and power became a human being to suffer everything that you and I suffer. To go through all our hells with us but even more to go through hell for us. God our Father means he is near. He's not creepy like Santa. When you think about it, Santa's creepy. He's not near in that way. He is near in kindness, in goodness, in holding you And communicating his truth to you. He wants your, his truth to be experienced by you and me. Yet friends, we hold him at arm's length. We, we, we project onto him all kinds of distortions of who he is. We keep ourselves distant from him in a sense of shame that we think he is treating us like others have treated us. He is treating us like maybe, maybe some unhealthy parent figures in our life or, or authority figures or, 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 or friends. We, we think that he's shaming us when in reality, friends, he's taken our shame on himself to draw you and I into his arms. And he's ever pursuing you and I in our brokenness and our sin and our filth and the things that are hidden and nobody else knows. The darkness he is near. David explains that even in the darkness, you are there with me. 
But friends, we will not know him as our good father, who's all-powerful and our maker and creator. We will not if we don't let him near. If we continue to hold him at arm's length. John expresses this in chapter 1, verse 12, explaining about Jesus' is coming to us, to all who received him, to all who believe in his name. He gives the right to become children of God. We're all made by God, but we will not know him as our father unless we believe and receive, unless we surrender, unless we stop running and let him catch us in his relentless love. We will continue to be enslaved by our distortions of who God is, distant and eventually destroyed. We must come and we must respond. He will not do it all for us. In love, he created us with the ability to choose. Your God the Father is inviting you this morning even through his Son Receive, believe. Believe how I reveal myself. Believe the truth. No longer believing your distortions. Come. I am God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, for your good. Paul says this in Corinthians chapter 8. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. Again, the authors of, of Rooted say this in conclusion. You may be in some grim situations right now. Maybe you feel trapped and alone. At work, in your family, in your job. But the Almighty, Father God, reaches out to you from the cross. His love and power are relentless. He will not stop until he redeems the people for himself. He will not stop until evil is driven from creation and every tear of the redeemed is wiped away. Belief in a God like this revives the soul and even gives us the boldness to go out fearlessly in mission to serve the world as he has. Come this morning. As we sing this final song of what we believe, I invite you to exchange what the, what, what the Lord has revealed in you this morning, the distortions to exchange and to give those to the Father and, and receive him as he is. Receive the truth and believe upon that because we believe in God the Father Almighty, the good Father, maker of you and of all heaven and earth. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, set us free. May we believe on your truth. May we believe, God, in your existence, but not only that you exist, Lord, as a blank canvas for us to recreate and distort, but God, you exist as a good Father who is working with all the evil at work, with the brokenness of other people around us in our lives, even the scars that we bear ourselves, and you are redeeming it all through your Son. He went through hell in our place to offer us freedom. And at the same time, thank you, God, that you are near, that you are in our hell right now. Thank you. Redeem us this morning with your truth. In your name we pray.